Are we ready to start, inshallah? Yes, sir. Awesome. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome, everyone, to another uh, blessed Friday here. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Inna alhamdulillah wa nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'khfiru wa na'awuzu billah min shuroori anfusina wa min sayyati amalina. Man yahdihillahu falamudillalah wa man yudlil falahadiyalah. Ashadu wa la ilaha illa allahu wa adhu la sharika la. Anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluhu. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu tuku allaha haqqa tukatihi. Wa la tamutunna illa wa antum muslimoon. Ya ayyuhal nasa tuku rabbukum alazi khalakakum min nafsin wahida. Wa khalakam minha zawjaha. Wa batha minhuma. Rijalin kathiran wa nisaa. Wa attaku allaha alazi tusa'aluna bihi wal arham. Inna allaha kana alaykum rakiba. Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu tuku allaha wa kulu kawlan sadeeda. Yuslih lakum amalakum. Wa yaghfir lakum zunubakum. وَمَنْ يَتِي اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَعَزَ فَعَزَ نَعْزِيمًا All thanks and praise is due to Allah. We seek His help and His forgiveness. We seek refuge in Allah from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. And whosoever Allah guides will never be led astray. And whosoever Allah leads astray will never find guidance. And I bear witness that there is no God but Allah and alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad وسلم, is his servant and his messengers. And oh, you have believed, fear Allah as he should be feared, and do not die except as Muslims in submission to him. O oh, mankind, fear your Lord who created you from one soul and created from it its mate and dispersed from both of them many men and women. And fear Allah through whom you ask one another, verily Allah is ever watching over you. O oh, you have believed, fear Allah and speak words of appropriate justice. He will amend for you your deeds, forgive you your sins, and whoever obeys Allah and his messenger has certainly attained a great attainment. My dear brothers and sisters, we started down this journey of uh, the 99 names of Allah. Inshallah, I'm going to continue down this journey today as well. And I'm going in a sequence. So if you're following along, then each one of these uh, khutbas, inshallah, in this series, they're going in order. The last time we met, we discussed uh, five of the 99 names of Allah, Al-Jabbar, Al-Mutakabbir, Al-Kharik, Al-Bari, Al -Bari, and Al-Musawar. And today we're going to continue this with three names of Allah, Al-Ghaffar, Al-Qahar, and Al-Wahhab. I hope I provide you with enough details about each one of these attributes of Allah. Applying these attributes in our life is really the benefit that we should try to get out of this uh, exercise. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is al-ghaffar, the one who is full of forgiveness, the one who forgives time and again in perpetuity. Every transgression we, we commit, Allah is ready to forgive us. Regardless of how big we may think the sin is, Allah will forgive us with the exception of one. There's only one sin that Allah does not forgive, and that is associating someone else with him in worship. We're reminded about this in the Quran in Surah Nisa, verse 48, among others. Indeed, Allah does not forgive associating others with him in worship, but forgives anything else of whoever he wills. And whoever associates others with Allah has indeed committed a grave sin. Now, the root word of al-ghafar is ghayn, fa, and ra, which is in classical Arabic means to cover, to veil, to forgive, to pardon, protect something, and by extension, the one who forgives is the one who conceals and covers that which we find troublesome or ugly. Allah has given us the ability to praise beautiful act and also similarly react or reject ugly acts. By concealing that which is ugly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing us his mercy and forgiving us. Now, think about this for a moment. When was the last time you had a horrible thought? When was the last time a thought where you considered something ill for somebody else, even if it's a fleeting thought? A thought where you were contemplating action that would otherwise be viewed as unacceptable by yourself or even anyone else. And you may have thought that something would put you in less favorable light amongst your community members if they could see within that moment what you're actually thinking. This ability for us to think about our actions before we commit them is a mercy from Allah. It's like having a buffer between us and the world around us. And Allah is putting a veil over us and telling us, you know what, it's okay. Your thoughts are safe with me. 
Now, if we continue with this thought, we dwell on it, then that's when it becomes problematic, especially if it's an ugly thought. Now, if it was you know, no longer a passing thought and become a thought that's going to morph into action, we have to always make sure that those actions are aligned with what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prescribed for us and warn us about that these are not the things you should be doing or these are the things that you should be doing. What we ultimately want to try and do is commit a sin consciously, thinking about it and saying, okay, this is what we're going to do. This is what I'm going to do. Now, thinking about a thought that is beautiful and acting upon it, Allah will give us many more rewards for that. Now, when we think of something that is bad and we act upon it, Allah records it as one bad action. But when we do something and we do something that is good and we think about it prior, there's many more times that reward. And the reward of, Allah, of our actions is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is uh, emphasizing a hadith recorded in Sahih al-Bukhari. The Prophet ﷺ said, Allah has forgiven my followers the evil thoughts that occur to their minds as long as such thoughts are not put into action or uttered. And you can find this in Sahih al-Bukhari. And it's an important lesson for us to take away that not all of our thoughts basically relate to or, or constitute sin. If we thought about it and it's a passing thought and we say, okay, that's it, khalas, done. That's the end of that. We shouldn't be uttering these thoughts out because that's when you start going from just a fleeting thought to something more than that. And at the same time, when we speak of these things, it's no longer an idea that's just within us. It's now something that's out there in the world and for somebody else to maybe pick up on it. And we always want to be able to try and put good thoughts out there, thoughts that will not just benefit us, but also benefit our community members, our neighbors, our family members. And the veil over our thoughts in our mind is not the only veil that Allah provides for us. Allah also gives us a soul which holds desires, it holds hopes, it holds dreams. And that's another way that Allah is concealing our shortcomings by giving us space to process that which comes to us as impulse and desires. And we all have them. We all have them in different strengths. We all have them in different uh, flavors. And our feelings need to be processed. And this is where Allah has given us the space to do that. Now, on this topic of processing feelings, I, I don't want to leave you with an impression that it's the only place where you have to work things out, whatever it might be within yourself. We sometimes do need professionals and those professionals are probably better trained in, in areas that we ourselves might not be able to handle. So I don't want to leave you with that impression that you, know, you should try and handle everything on your own. For our day-to-day -day dealings, however, you know, Allah has given us this space. Allah has said, you know, whatever goes within you, whatever that thing might be that's driving you, as long as it's driving you towards Allah, you should keep doing it. But if it's not, you need to try and uh, process that within yourself. Now, if we couldn't, if we didn't have that space, you know, imagine a scenario you're in a marketplace and you see something you like a lot and it serves a need for you. And if you were thinking out loud and everybody could see your thoughts, the shopkeeper will upsell you all day long. So just having that ability to just shield yourself from everybody and internalize things and figure things out before you do anything, that alhamdulillah is a blessing from Allah. Now, I do want to highlight that when we talk about the heart, we're not talking about the fleshy muscle that is within our chest. We're talking about the soul or the nafs that drives us from within. And it is the soul that has the desires and yearning to connect with Allah. And if we practice connecting with him on a regular basis, you know, that, that taste just becomes so much more sweeter. And Allah can see what we keep secret within ourselves. Allah knows what is inside of our hearts. Nobody else does. And Allah is all forgiving, all forgiving, and most merciful. And Allah reminds us about this in Surah Taha. Wa inni lima taba wa amana wa amilu salihan thumma ahatta. But I am truly most forgiving to whoever repents, believes, and does good, then persists on true guidance. So it's that continuity continually striving to do good, continually striving to follow guidance. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also al qahar the dominator. Allah is the one before whom all creation has humbled itself. He subhanahu wa ta'ala prevails over all creation, the universe, all of its laws are derived from Allah and nothing, 
Nothing in our world or the universe operates on its own laws. The rising of the sun and the setting of the moon, these are rules that Allah has created for these constellations in our universe. And there is no power that is greater than Allah. Now the word kahar comes from the root ka, ha, and ra, which in Arabic means to overcome, to overpower, to subdue, and to subjugate. And as Muslims, it's easy for us to recognize that Allah is over all things, including the day of judgment. We are reminded in Surah Ghafir verse 16, the day all will appear before Allah. Nothing about them will be hidden from him. He will ask, who does all authority belong to this day? To Allah, the one, the supreme. Lillahil wahidil qahar. Lillahil wahidil qahar. Allah, the one, the supreme. What about applying this attribute in our lives? Among all the things that can influence us, it's our nafs that has the greatest influence over our actions and the one that gets us into most trouble when we choose to do so. And our nafs is also our soul. It is within us and it drives us towards action. And sometimes this action is rooted in impulse. Sometimes it's rooted in spur of the moment passion or something that you just want to do right away. So for us to apply this attribute in our lives means to control our nafs to fight the impulses that keep us focused in this world instead of the hereafter. If we can control our nafs, we can control shaitan or Satan. And to overcome our nafs is to overcome shaitan. And shaitan knows this. There's a hadith as reported by Anas and Sahih Muslim, when Allah fashioned Adam in paradise, he left him as he liked him to leave. Then Iblis roamed around him to see what actually was and he found him hollow within. And he recognized that he had been created with a disposition that he would not have control over himself. So shaitan controls us through our passions and through our desires, whether it's accumulating wealth, whether it's uh, having all these possessions within this world, or, or even just being able to give back to the community with the intent of receiving praise from the community. He whispers to us, whispers to us sweet things, drives us to ruin by appealing to our basal instincts. Everything from fame to grandeur to pleasure, you name it. Shaitan doesn't force us into action. And that's something we struggle with. We, that is something we forget very, very quickly. He's always chipping away at us, always finding ways to nudge us into a specific direction. And he keeps provoking us ever so lightly. Okay? so. Just even being in Salah, for example, you know, if you, for example, start thinking about, oh, what is it that I have to do next? That's just shaitan chipping away at us. And it's so hard, so hard to focus on these things, but that's what we have to work on within ourselves. Good or bad, whatever that action might be, shaitan is always going to be there to influence us, to corrupt the thing that we want to do that is good. And that is something that we must be watchful for. And this is a never ending task, my dear brothers and sisters, it's never ending. You know, you start your salah, for example, with the best of intentions. I'm going to focus right now and nothing's going to get in the way of my thought. But then before you know it, there's all these things that are coming through your mind. It happens to all of us. We're distracted just enough, just enough for shaitan to say, yep, I was able to chip away at that salah. And there's an authentic hadith that mentioned this phenomenon and informs us about what we should do to improve our salah. Abdullah ibn Amr reported that the Prophet ﷺ said, if a Muslim man persists in two actions, he will enter the garden. They are easy, but those who do them are few. And he was asked, he ﷺ was asked, what are they? And he said that you say Allahu Akbar 10 times, Alhamdulillah 10 times, and SubhanAllah 10 times after every prayer. That is 150 on your tongue and 1,500 in the balance just by saying it that many times. I saw the prophet, peace be upon him, counting them with his hand. Then he said, when you go to bed, you should say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, and Allahu Akbar. And that is the equivalent of 100 times on your tongue and 1,000 times in the balance. And who among you can do 2,500 bad actions morning and night? The Messenger of Allah was asked, Messenger of Allah, how is it that they're not counted? He said, Shaitan comes to one of you while he's praying and reminds him of something he has to do, such and such and such and such, and so he does not remember to do it. So this is not 
uh, new as a phenomenon. We, we all struggle with it. But just remembering to do these things, just reminding ourselves at the end of Salah, please make sure you say SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, 10 times each. And that's just one way that we can keep ourselves closer and, and stop shaitan from chipping away at our Salah. So let's also remind ourselves, my, brother, my dear brothers and sisters, that when we go to bed, there's no guarantee that we will wake up in the morning. So we should always be thankful to Allah and be grateful. So just saying SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar is an easy one for us to say, you know, may Allah please give us the opportunity to wake up the next day, or at least remind ourselves that before we go to bed, that Allah is supreme and over all of us. Allah is also al wahhab the bestower, the one who is generous, gives freely without expectations of any return. He benefits all of creation, whether it's halal or haram. And he subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most liberal of givers and he gives to those who are both deserving and undeserving alike. And he gives to those who do good and he also gives to those who do evil. Wahhab comes from the root word wa, ha, and ba, which in classical Arabic means to give for no compensation, to give a gift, to bestow liberally and give freely. And for people being generous without the additional expectation of receiving anything in return is so difficult. It's so easy for us to say, well, I'm doing something, you know, I, I want something in return. We do this without thinking sometimes, you know, I would probably say that it's inconceivable for us as humans to even give anything without an expectations of return. It's something we have to work on ourselves constantly. And why is that? This is where our nafs gets in the way. We give with expectations, and that's what our nafs does. We give transactionally. We nurture those relationships within our community, within our work circle, in hopes that this will yield a benefit to us sometime in the future. Whether we do this for our physical relationships, meeting in the office, virtual relationships, you know, we're working from home these days, so most of our conversations are virtual, or as millennials and Gen Zers would say, our analog and digital relationships. How do we treat them? Are we treating them transactionally? And we give generously during the month of Ramadan with hopes that we will find ourselves in genital fardas on the day of judgment. We fast in the month of Ramadan to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the hope that Allah will forgive our past sins. Or perhaps we donate large sums of money in hopes to find our name recognized because of our generosity. Maybe even have our name plastered on some big university somewhere, you know, some big building. And that's our human nature. We are transactional. We're, we do this by default because that's the society that we have around us and that's what we tend to emulate. And this is not the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He subhanahu wa ta'ala wants us to be generous and give without expectation because Allah gives without expectations. And to be truly generous, to be truly, truly generous, we have to learn how to give for the sake of giving. We have to learn how to nurture those relationships for the sake of Allah and expect that our reward will come from him especially when it comes to our relationship with Allah. We cannot build a relationship with Allah if we expect something in return. Think about it like this. Each and every one of us make dua, we're asking Allah for paradise. We worship Allah five days, five times a day for the sake of finding ourselves in paradise. That to me sounds super transactional. Paradise is not our goal. Our goal should be building that connection, building that relationship with Allah Ta'ala. If we have the goal of paradise and we could get to paradise without Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, why, why even worship? Is that the mindset we wanna carry with us? Is that how we wanna treat our relationship with Allah that I will get paradise in return for worshiping Allah? I will get all my sins in the past forgiven because I'm now worshiping Allah? Super transactional. And that is not how we want to build our relationship with Allah. So it's important for us that we nurture this mindset within us that we want to give for the sake of Allah and we will find that our reward is with Allah. Take the example of our children. Do we take care of our children with the expectation that they will benefit us in the future, that when we get older, you know, our son or our daughter is going to take care of us. Uh, they'll help us. We'll be completely dependent on them. That's not how we keep our minds as parents. You know, we're always looking after them 
for the sake of them. We don't keep a ledger somewhere writing every single good deed or bad deeds that they did or what we did for them or you know, whether they took the trash out or didn't or did the laundry or any of those other chores. You know, million and one things that we want our kids to do, but they don't necessarily do and want them to do. Those are all things that we don't hold against them. We will still take care of them when and if they need our help, regardless of what age they are. That's just how we take care of our children. We have this mindset that we will take care of them. And so our mindset needs to have that same evolution within us when it comes to our relationship with Allah. There is no power in this universe greater than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we believe this and we call ourselves Muslims, then paradise is just a benefit. It is a benefit of having that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Having our sins forgiven is a benefit of just having that relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And ultimately, you know, we're not going to go to paradise because we prayed five times a day. That's hollow. We have to be able to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we will be accountable for every single one of our actions. So just a reminder for myself first and then all of you is that let's build that relationship with Allah. Let's make sure that we are not thinking about our relationship as a transaction. And that paradise is just another place for us, just like hellfire is. And hopefully, inshallah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be pleased with us enough to put us in paradise. So we should hope for that. However, it should not predicate how we build our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The destination, my dear brothers and sisters, is Allah. It is not necessarily just paradise. In Surah Al-Ankabut, uh, we are reminded, so seek provision from Allah alone, worship him and be grateful to him. To him, you will all be returned. And Allah gives us our provisions. Allah gives us honor, children, health, countless other bounties to all of his creations. And we as Muslims have to remind ourselves to practice generosity without any expectation. And it's hard. It is so very hard. However, if we're going to apply this attribute of Allah in our lives, this is what we have to learn in practice. So inshallah, I'll conclude this khutbah in the second half. I seek forgiveness from Allah for me and for you and to the rest of the Muslims. So ask him for forgiveness. He is the forgiver, the merciful. <clears throat> In the name of Allah, the exalted, and blessings and peace be upon the Messenger of Allah. My dear respected brothers and sisters, I briefly, so very briefly, touched on the three beautiful names of Allah, Al-Ghaffar, Al-Qahar, and Al-Wahab. All of us should try and emulate as many of the qualities of Allah in our lives so that we can become closer to Allah. If you hang out with the Sufis, you will learn that their focus is always trying to get their hearts purified, their nafs. You know, it's not the fleshy part inside the, you know, the chest cavity, it's that soul. It's trying to, to clean it, trying to purify it. And the analogy they use is that the nafs is like an old metal container that has tarnish all around it. To remove that tarnish, you really just have to, you know, scrub it, scrub it hard. That elbow grease that needs to come into picture so that you can scrub all that tarnish off comes in the way of the remembrance of Allah. So if you replace the container with the heart, the nafs, and then you replace the cloth and the elbow grease with the remembrance of Allah, it's an appropriate analogy. It's a beautiful imagery that I carry with myself in my mind to remind myself that this is something that we must always try and do. Always try and just you know, polish that heart, polish that, give it that extra shine so that when you look into it, you see the reflection of Allah. And Abu Harira, may uh, Allah be pleased with him, reported, the messenger of Allah said, Allah, the exalted, says, I am as my slave expects me to be. I am with him when he remembers me. If he remembers me inwardly, I will remember him inwardly. And if he remembers me in an assembly, I will remember him in a better assembly. That is in an assembly of angels. And with Ramadan, just a few days away, my brother and sister, we're in an exciting time. I mean, this is, again, most of us are still quarantined. So this will be the second year in a row that we're now you know, observing Ramadan while we're in quarantine. We should take this as an opportunity to connect with Allah as often as we can. If we 
are unable to or uncomfortable making it to the masjid for taraweeh, I'm sure there'll be some local mosque doing this. We should make time to connect with it a lot through the Quran. So simple, just read the Quran, reflect on it, understand it. Pray all the sunnah and nafil prayers if you can make the time for it and learn to forgive those who have transgressed against us. And this is the Ramadan is the best month to try and reset ourselves, press that reset button to say, okay, I'm now going to try to be better. You know, but why wait until Ramadan starts? You know, you should start today. Now is a good time to start like any. We should learn to keep our nafs in check and overcome our desires and direct those energies towards Allah. Don't let it fester or linger in our mind. And we should learn to give generously without expecting in return. We should remind ourselves that our reward is with Allah on the day of judgment. And no one is a better keeper of record than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My dear brothers and sisters, I hope you're finding benefit from these discussions. Like you, I am a seeker of knowledge and I am prone to making mistakes, but may Allah forgive me for any mistakes that I have made here today. And let us all pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides our hearts towards him. May we all find inside our hearts the strength to stay firm on the path of Allah. And may Allah forgive our shortcomings for he is oft forgiving, most merciful. O oh Allah, when we stray, please forgive us and allow us to return back to guidance and the path that you have prescribed for us. O oh Allah, please improve us in character so that we may become better versions of ourselves. O Allah, please have mercy upon our parents and pardon their transgressions and shortcomings. And please have mercy upon us all on the day of judgment and keep us away from the torments of the grave. And please allow us to live a dignified life in this world and the hereafter. And please guard our health, the health of those who we love and the health of those who endeavor to provide care and service to our community members. Rabbana la tuzih khulubna ba'da iz hadaytana wa hablana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al-wulhab. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al-akhirati hasana wa kina azab al-nar. Rabbana faqfir lana zunubna wa kafir anna sayyatina wa tawafana ma al-abrar. Allahumma innaka afum tuhib al-afwa fafu anna. Allahumma innaka afum tuhib al-afwa fafu anna. Rabbi rhamhuma akumar rabbayani zagira. إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربة وينحى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعزكم لعلكم تذكرون فاذكروني أذكركم واشكروا لي ولا تكفرون My dear brothers and sisters, may you enjoy this Jum'ah and may you have a blessed rest of the day. Amen.